All right, so what I want to do now is I want to talk about the German tank problem. <coughs> so hopefully this will record well. We will find out. So anybody here hear of the German tank problem? Oh, excellent. OK. So here are two maps of Europe. This is 1939, before the start of major hostilities. This is in 1942, and you can see the Germans driving into the Soviet Union. You can see France has already fallen. One of the reasons the Germans were able to advance so quickly was because of their masterful use of tanks. It became essential for the Allies to understand how many tanks did the Germans have. So how many were being produced and how many were in different theaters. So I have gone to YouTube and I think this should be the one so this will be a map of what's happening in Europe day by day. And so you can just see, you know, right now this is the Poland being divided by the Nazis and the Soviets. And then you have the phony war where for a long period of time nothing is happening in November. We have to just go to May really before we start seeing anything. So I'll skip a little bit. Here's March, still basically nothing happening. April, nothing happening. Oh, well, a little bit up there, but I'm saying the, the, the real stuff is going to be happening here. And now you can see, you know, coming into France, how quickly it is. Italy now joins, and you just see the rapid fall. Uh, you'll eventually see the Germans and the Italians in southeastern Europe, and that's going to delay Operation Barbarossa, the invasion of the Soviet Union by Germany, by several weeks. And a lot of people feel that if Hitler had not been helping the Italians, in 1941 in southeastern Europe and had actually had five more weeks of good weather, even with some of the strategic missteps that would have been enough to have you know, made a difference. And so just because you know, we don't want to do the Hulk, I'll just jump a little bit ahead. So here's April, May, I think I'm going to go a little bit too far ahead. You've already seen, yeah, okay, sorry, I went a little bit too far ahead, I think. And you've already seen the invasions you know, coming into Russia and just how quickly this is all happening. So it's, it's an interesting video to just watch as the army units are moving. All right, so I will stop here and go back to the pure map. So it was essential to find out how many tanks there were. And there are a couple of different ways you can do it. One way is through spies and espionage, and another way is through math and stats. And so the question is, which way do you think is going to do a better job, spies or mathematicians? Yeah, yeah given the fact that you have a mathematician <coughs> here lecturing to you, you know, almost surely it's going to be a mathematician. So just a you know, picture of the German tank production. How do you find out how many tanks they're doing? So if you actually can get access to some of the records of the factories, that is a good way to figure out what's going on. So we talk. So you could have spies. And when you're trying to decide how do you want to use your agents, finding out how many tanks are being produced is potentially a good choice. But then you have to weigh that to, well, do I want my spy to be going for how many tanks are being produced, or do I want them going for where the Germans are going to be attacking next? So because of <coughs> the fact that the British had cracked with the help of the Polish and a few others, the German code enigma, they often knew the orders to German generals. But they had a very hard and fast rule. They could never act on knowledge that could only have plausibly been obtained from cracking the German codes. They had to make sure the Germans always felt that their codes were secure. So in fact, there were times when the British and allies would fly reconnaissance missions over the Mediterranean, and ah, we discovered a German uh, battle group in the Mediterranean. We discovered a German troop carrier in the Mediterranean. They already knew it was there but they had to give the Germans a plausible explanation of how they discovered them. And sadly, a lot of pilots lost their lives flying missions where the information that they were getting was not really needed, but they needed a, a way to explain how they would find it. So the German tank problem is after a battle, maybe you capture or you see the remains of a couple of German tanks, and you observe the serial numbers on the captured tanks say S1, S2, all the way up to S3, so we've captured or destroyed K tanks. Given that information, 
how would you estimate the number of tanks produced? And so the original formulation is we assume the tanks are numbered from 1 to n. We observe k tanks. The largest value is m. And we want to estimate the number of tanks n as some function of the largest observed number and the number of tanks observed. The more general formulation, and I can't believe that this wasn't done, so I did this a few years ago, was imagine you don't know what the smallest tank number is. So it's drawn from, say, n1 to n2. You observe k tanks. Now the smallest is m1, the largest is m2. So you have a spread of m2 minus m1. What's annoying is if you have, let's say that only two tanks were made, and you're lucky and you destroy both of them. And the serial numbers are 3 and 4. Well, if you look at 4 minus 3, that's 1. So the spread is actually going to be one less than the number of tanks. So we know the number of tanks is going to be you know, smallest, largest, plus plus. A little bookkeeping. So whenever things are being done in real time, never worry about the small algebra details. Always go big picture. And I have you know, a very nice write-up of all this if anybody's interested. So if the Germans knew that the Allies were doing this, they would have encrypted the serial numbers. And in fact, people do that now. They don't want you to know how much stuff is out there. Mm -hmm. so just start at one. Yeah. Exactly. If you've ever gone to a piano bar, you know, what, would, what would you see at a piano bar? Other than a piano and a piano player. A tip jar. A tip jar. Oh, <laughs> what do you think the tip jar starts with at the, at the beginning of the shift? Lots of money. Lots of money. Yeah. So that it looks like, oh, other people have been generous. I don't want to look bad. I'll put some money. You're not going to start with an empty tip jar. So there are a lot of things where you're not going to naturally start at zero or one. And you want to try to figure out what's being added, what's the change. OK. So what could be dangers of underestimating or overestimating? Anybody want to give me a danger? Well, you want to have as many tanks as they have. So you would want to make sure you bring the right number. You want to make sure you bring the right number. So if you overestimate how many tanks they have, you, you could lose the battle. If you underestimate, you might overcommit your forces. No, it's other way around, other way around. If you overestimate how many tanks they have, you could overcommit your forces. <coughs> and then you would be using tanks in a place where they're not that necessary. And then there could be another theater of war which you are losing out on. It's the old arms race. It's the old arms race. So uh, I will. So many bad Union generals during the Civil War, it's hard to choose just one. Anybody want to suggest an overly cautious Union general? No, Grant was not overly cautious. He eventually went against Lincoln in 1864. I'm sorry? General McClellan. And Lincoln famously remarked, and there's lots of different versions of this depending on which side you go to. Like, McClellan is he going to use his army? I'd like to borrow it for a time. Yeah. <coughs> <coughs> so at the end of the Civil War, Grant had a very different strategy. Engage the Southern Army. It wasn't about capturing territory. It was about engage the Southern Army in the field. They can't afford to trade soldier for soldier. Just keep engaging, wear them down. We have more resources. It doesn't matter who holds which territory. Get the army. In the Revolutionary War, the main continental strategy was to make sure Washington's army was not defeated. That as long as the army was still there. Uh, so from Wikipedia, fountain of all knowledge, source of all wisdom. Although number two to one, Lee committed his entire force. This is the Battle of History Quiz. Antietam. So it was technically a Union victory because Lee had to retreat from Union territory. But it could have been a far, far stronger victory. Uh, McClellan sent in less than three quarters of his army, enabling Lee to fight the Federals to a standstill. McClellan's persistent but erroneous belief that he was outnumbered contributed to his cautiousness throughout the campaign. And in fact, they had even captured the Confederate plans for the attack on Antietam. And there was a real concern, are these really the Confederate plans? There's a wonderful movie titled something like The Man Who Did Not Ex Live or The Man Who Did Not Exist, something like that. And this was during World War II where it was from one of the invasions. 
where the British basically took a dead body, dressed them up in military uniform, had them in a plane that crashed off the coast of Spain, where the water would have them swept up with documents about planned British invasions. It might have been in Italy, I forget where. But the whole point was to plant false information in such a way that the Germans would believe it was legitimate and act accordingly. A tremendous amount of all of this is about controlling the flow of information and presenting things in just the right way that you can get people to do what you want to do. McClellan was extremely cautious and always felt that Lee had more army, more men in his army than he did, and I need more troops before I can successfully engage him. And this is one of the dangers of overestimating the enemy's force. If you had attacked, if you'd been more vigorous, more ambitious, the war could have ended a lot sooner. Uh, so what I want to do is I want to talk a little bit about the mathematical preliminaries. So we'll see binomial coefficients, which are generalizations of the factorial function. I'll talk about the original formulation of the German tank problem. I will say just a little bit about the new version. Uh, you don't want to see the algebra. It's essentially the same as this but with even more technical details to go through. It's at the level that you could do with a good high school or middle school student who can do factorials. The algebra isn't that bad. You just have to do a lot of multiplying by one and adding zero to just clean things up. And then the last part, which I really want to do, is talk a little bit about statistics, about how do you take data from the real world and gather some ideas of what to do. We've already talked a little bit about this when we did cryptography, when we were talking about letter frequencies where what you can do is, well, crap, I don't know what the letter frequencies are. Oh, well, let me just take a book in front of me, and I'll go through it, and I'll count how many E's, how many T's. It's not going to be perfect, but it will give me a good rough start, and I can use that to begin. So even if I don't know the letter frequencies, I can derive approximate values by doing a quick test. All right, mathematical preliminaries. So we've already done n factorial. It's the number of ways to order n objects when order matters. So president is different than vice president is different than secretary, whereas in the House of Representatives, all Congress people are equal. Uh, one of our vice presidents famously quipped one that once when asked, so what do you do as vice president? You die, I fly. <laughs> the binomial coefficient, n choose k or n c k, is how many ways to choose k objects from n when order matters. Oh, so an order doesn't matter, an order doesn't matter. So now everybody's the same, everybody's a representative, there's no president, no vice president, anything like that. So if I wanted to choose five people from 20, there'd be 20 choices for the first, 19 for the second, 18 for the third, 17 for the fourth, 16 for the fifth. So if I wanted to choose k people where order matters, it's actually n factorial divided by n minus k factorial. Because the n minus k factorial just kills all the stuff downwards. So if I had k equals 2, I would have n times n minus 1. And then the rest of the n minus 2, n minus 3, n minus 4, n minus 5 would be killed with the n minus 2, n minus 3, n minus 4, n minus 5. And then dividing by the k factorial, that just says, well, look, if I have k objects, I have k factorial ways of arranging them. You know, who's the president? Who's the vice president? What you can do is you can temporarily put on labels. So there's n factorial divided by n minus k factorial ways to choose k people from n when order matters. And now I remove the ordering by saying, look, all these k factorial arrangements should be counted as the same. OK. It turns out that there are tremendous generalizations of this. Uh, if you teach statistics and you do the central limit theorem or the Gaussian or the bell curve, it turns out the most interesting factorial is negative 1 half. The factorial of negative 1 half is the square root of pi. And there is a way to make this a meaningful statement. Obviously, it no longer means what we think it means. You know, if I have an integer, 3 factorial is the number of ways to arrange 3 people. What does it mean to talk about the number of ways to arrange negative half of a person? <laughs> but there's ways to generalize these things. The last thing is the binomial theorem. So x plus y to the n is the sum of n choose k, x to the k, y to the n minus k. There's a lot of ways to prove this. One thing is when you expand this out, I'm going to have a bunch of x's and y's. And if I choose x k times, I then have to choose y n minus k times. So my possibilities are going to be x to the k, y to the n minus k. 
and I just have to figure out the coefficient. Well, I basically said it. If I want to have an x to the k, then it, the n factors, k times I choose x. And the remaining n minus k times I choose y. So that's where the n choose k comes from. I choose x k times. Right? So you might have seen this in Pascal's identity. So Pascal's triangle. So I'm going to prove Pascal's relation. And I will do an example with Red Sox and Angel fans. So imagine there are n wonderful people they root for the Red Sox. And we have one Yankee fan who is allowed in our midst. And I want to look at how many ways can I choose a group of k people from these n plus 1 people. So most of combinatorics comes down to counting something two different ways. Well, if I have n plus 1 people and I want to choose k people, that's just by the definition of the binomial coefficient, it's just n plus 1 choose k. Let's count it another way. I'm going to count it on whether or not my group contains the Yankee fan or not. The first case, I'm fortunate that I don't choose the Yankee fan. So, uh, oh, that should not be an n choose 0. It's good that I'm doing this. This should be 1 choose 0. You know, there's one Yankee fan, I don't choose them. Uh, and then I have to choose k people from the Red Sox. And then over here, this should be 1 choose 1. I choose the Yankee fan, and now I have k minus 1 people to choose from the uh, Yankees. Now, what's nice is, how many ways are there to choose one person? Oh, to choose zero people from n? One. So this part is like, it doesn't matter that I have a typo there. Unfortunately, this is quite wrong. <laughs> that should be a one. One. one choose one is one, but n choose one is n. So that's a really bad typo, so I'm very glad that I'm doing a beta <laughs> test here. Yeah, that's good. Absolutely. You're welcome. Hopefully the Allies will still win the war when we're done today. <laughs> I remember in physics class once there was a minus sign error and the problem was equivalent to throwing an ice cube in the pool and the pool freezes. <laughs> and so the heat transfer went the wrong direction. So here's Pascal's triangle and you can see each number is the sum of the number to the left and to the right above it. So you know, 10 is 6 plus 4, 6 is 5 plus 1, 20 is 10 plus 10. And these are the coefficients when we expand out x plus y to the end. x squared plus 2xy plus y squared x cubed plus 3x squared y plus 3xy squared plus y cubed and so on and so on. So Pascal's triangle, how many of you have seen Pascal's triangle? Probably, Okay, how many of you have ever looked at Pascal's triangle through the lens of a clock? Okay, so in the interest of time, I'm not going to use a standard clock with 12 hours, I'm going to use a binary clock. So we're going to look at it modulo 2. So all I'm going to care about is it an even number or an odd number. And then nobody has written the program to do this. It shocked me, so I wrote the program to do this. It was easier for me to just rotate my triangle 90 degrees so it's not going like this. And what I'm going to do is if it's an odd number, I'm going to put a dot. If it's an even number, I'm going to just have a number. And I'm going to look and see what happens. And I'm going to add more and more rows. Well, if I write it like this, if I add more and more rows, I'm going to go into the courtyard and come back to the other side of the building and keep going off to infinity. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to constantly shrink my triangle so it always fits in the unit square. So as I add more and more rows, I'm going to keep compressing it. And so if you've never seen this picture before, it's a wonderful picture. It's Sapinski's triangle. And so if you... On its side, yes. And so it was just the way Mathematica plots things, it was easier to just do it like this than to be plotting so there. So these are all the odds. Okay. And so you know, here's, you're seeing a little bit of the structure. Um, which is a fractal. And so I should be able to play this. So this is a little lecture I gave on Pascal's triangle. So right about here, nothing is happening yet. I'm you know, setting it up to start running. Uh, and running is it plotting at it, point and compressing? And it? compressing. So you can adjust the speed at which it does everything. So right now it's adjusting speeds and whatnot. And you can see as it starts to zoom out, you can see Pascal's triangle coming. And it's absolutely wonderful, the structure that goes on here. Rather than looking at it in mod 2, what could we do? 
you could do any one, and so you can start putting in more colors and see what comes in. So you get, but they're all gonna be related to this. So there's, there's a lot of fun stuff you can do. Okay, so the next identity we need is if I sum m goes from k to big N of m choose k, it's n plus one choose k plus one. So let's see what that means. I'm basically, I'm keeping the bottom fixed and I'm changing the top, and the top goes from k to n. So over here, 10 is gonna be one plus two plus three plus four. So here, so, so here, k is going to be um, two. Uh, I, I, I guess k is going to be one. K is going to be so one. Two is the color of the hockey stick. The, the hockey stick, yeah. Uh, it's going to come down like this. So 10 is going to be 4 plus 3 plus 2 plus 1. Okay. 20 is going to be 10 plus 6 plus 3 plus 1. 15 is going to be 10 plus 4 plus 1. And that's in what letter is what then? So here, the bottom k, if I wanted to do this row, yeah. this is k equals 0. Okay, that's this one. is k equals 1. This okay. is k equals 2. So here, k equals 1. And what's the work? And lowercase m is going to range from 1 all the way up to n, so n here is going to be 5. So this should be equal to 5 plus 1 choose 1 plus 1. So this should be equal to 6 choose 2. Oh, and 6 choose six, 2 is 15. Six row, like, like Third call. It's a yeah. second entry, but the second entry we start with 0. So right, we get okay. the 0th entry, 1st entry, 2nd entry. So this is the hockey stick result. Okay, so you can at least check a couple of them. Six is one plus five, so any one you're checking here is going to work. Okay, so the proof, um, how many of you have seen proofs by induction? Okay, so if you've seen proofs by induction, this is screaming at you, do we by induction? So if you're looking for good problems for students, here's a nice one. You can observe the pattern, and you can even say, hey, try to figure out like this hockey stick sum in terms of something else on Pascal's triangle. Look around, see if you can sniff out the formula. So if I induct on n, knowing that k is fixed, the base case is pretty easy. So in the base case, n equals k. So I'm summing m goes from k to k. Oh, there's only one choice for m. So I get k choose k. How many ways are there to choose k elements from k? One. And then over here, I get k plus one choose k plus one. Also one. So the base case isn't that bad. The inductive step is a little bit harder. So now, I knew the answer was true when I went up to um, n, let's assume now I'll try to go up to n plus one. So by induction, I'm assuming that I've already done this for all values of n up to a certain point. So this is just gonna be n plus one choose k plus one. I've got n plus one choose k, and now I use Pascal's identity, and that's where the n plus two choose k plus one comes from. So this follows from Pascal's relation. It's a nice inductive step. So one way to prove a lot of combinatorial identities is by doing induction. Another is to tell stories. So one of my favorite stories, um, any Dr. Seuss fans? Okay, how old are your kids? So I actually got into a Dr. Seuss battle with one of my professors at, one of, one, one of my colleagues when I was a postdoc at Brown. Um, he ended up beating me because he had uh, more grandchildren and had, so he had the experience from when he was a father plus as a grandfather. But you know, we did a cat in the hat rumble to see who could go further. I mean, I was able to do at least a quarter of the book, which wasn't bad. So I'm going to look at two different things. N choose K. Oops, is it still in focus? OK, good. And N choose N minus K. And so I'm going to prove, is it, is it still focused? OK, I'm going to prove that these are equal. And I'm going to prove this by using uh, Dr. Seuss story. Anybody want to guess which story? No? <laughs> That's a good one. Has something to do with belts. Huh. Uh -huh. Nope. <laughs> well, that does have to do with belts. <laughs> <laughs> the Sneetches. 
there are two types of snitches on beaches, right? There are those with stars on their bellies and those that don't have stars. And there's a huge discussion as to is it better to have a star or not a star? And at the end, they realize it doesn't matter. So N choose K. I'm choosing K people to have a star on their belly, and only those people will have stars. Equivalently, I am choosing N minus K people not to have a star on their belly, and those are the only people not to have a star. So this is another way of showing an identity with coefficients. I could write this out. This is N factorial divided by K factorial, N minus K factorial. This is N factorial divided by N minus K factorial, N minus N minus K factorial. And when you do the algebra, you'll see that they're the same. But then it looks like, okay, it's true because of algebra. Whereas here, you can see choosing k is the same as excluding n minus k. And I prefer the story approach. Okay, so now let's go to the original German tank problem. All right. So my first question is, how should n hat depend on m, the maximum number of tanks observed, and k, the, the, the maximum tank number observed, and k, the number of tanks observed. So one of the things I really want my students to get a sense of is how do you conjecture formulas? So how would you guess a formula for something like this? So again, right now, I don't care what the actual answer is. What I care about is I want a guess as a function of m and k. So what might you think? How do you think the answer, so n hat, can you give me any information about your guess for n as a function of m and k? How should it depend on m? How should it depend on k? Has to be greater than k. What else does it have to be greater than k? Greater than equal to. Anything else? So we're assuming the first tank is 1 and the largest tank is n. It has to be less than m? Oh, that's the one we observe. No, no, no. M is the largest value we observe. We observe. And so the number of So n is the number of tanks. So here, I'll write it off. So, so n is number of tanks made m largest seen. So I think somebody just said it. What do you know about n and m? Your, your, your guess for n is greater than m. Yeah, it's, it's got to be m plus something, right? If you know the tanks start at 1 and the largest tank you observed is 35, there's got to be at least 35 tanks. So we can write our guess as m plus something. And already we're getting some idea. So now whatever that something is, it's going to have to depend on m and k. And so we want to try to figure out do you have any guesses for the functional form? As m increases, what do you think should happen to f of mk? So y decrease. Okay, so I'm trying to figure out how many tanks were made. I know it's m plus something. The larger that m is, do you think there's more tanks or less tanks? Do you think I have to add something to my guess or subtract? I'm sorry? You're not going to subtract because you want it to end up being a positive number. Good. So if it became negative, yeah. it would be less than it. That would be very bad. They could do they started as something other than one. <laughs> so, the, so we're saying that the, large, the larger m is, the more likelihood that there will be a larger number of tanks. Yeah. So fmk should increase with m. Now, for instance, I could give you a function fmk is 1 over m to the fifth. If I give you 1 over m to the fifth, that's never negative, so you'll never subtract things. But as m gets larger and larger and larger, it's adding less and less and less. I think it should be, I think it should be increasing with m. The more tanks that exist, the more you would be observing. Yes. And, and the more likely, the more likely you, well, not the more you're observing, you're only observing k. But the more likely you are to observe a large number. A large tank number. So we think it should be increasing with m. What about k? So if I now fix m, let's say the largest tank I observed is 35, and I increase k, 
So I observed more and more tanks, and the largest observed is still 35. Do you think there's more or less tanks? I'm sorry? Yeah, so it should increase with M, decrease with K. So for instance, if you only observed one tank, let's say you observed a tank and its value was 50, what might you guess for the total number of tanks? I'm sorry? Well, but you know the tanks start at one and, you get, and you, the only tank you observed is 50. What might you guess? Well, there's at least, at okay, least 50. Yeah. But if there were n tanks, and you had to guess, if you only observed one serial number from 1 to n, what would you guess you observed? The middle. The middle. Yeah. Uh, there so, if you, so you would probably guess that there's 100 tanks if you only observed one. Okay. If you observed one tank and its number was 70, what would you guess? 140. So. We know a little bit of extremes. If we had two tanks that we observed, we might think that maybe the large tank might be around the two-thirds mark. Right. Okay. So we might want to inflate by a factor of three halves. Mm -hmm. And so with a little bit of work, this is a bit harder, you might come up with, you know, probably the simplest thing I could think of is something like M over K. As M gets larger, this gets larger. As K gets larger, this gets smaller. And again, what I want to do is I want to sniff out a formula. So when I have my students, I tell them, almost surely you are not going to be counting German tanks in the field. <laughs> but the idea of how do you sniff out a functional relationship, that's something that can be valuable. Now we have some extreme cases. There is one value of k where you know how many tanks there are. You may not know that you know. K equals n. Yeah, k, k equals what? Equals n. Equals N. N. Not M. N. N. But you don't know what N is. Correct. So you don't know that you know. Ah, oh, okay. But if K equals N, if K equals N, I think if you observe as many tanks as the highest number, then then what would M what would M equal if K equals N? Yes, so you would know M would have to be N. Well, if we plug in M equals K equals N, we get N plus 1. So that means we should probably fix this formula. How should we fix this formula? Subtract 1. So that's our guess. And we got this guess by looking at extreme cases. So this is the power of extreme cases. We also, we, we did k equals 1, we did k equals n. We got a lot of information from that. Well, I can factor this a little bit. This is the same as m, 1 plus 1 over k minus 1. And this is a really nice formula. It may not be correct, but it matches what we know. All right, so now that we have this conjecture, you know, I was just, just going through what we're doing. It actually turns out it's correct. You can prove algebraically, combinatorially, that that is the best guess for the number of tanks. And it has all of the features we want. It is reasonable. And you know, as I said, you look at sanity checks, extreme cases. I always emphasize this to my students. Look at the most ridiculous cases possible and build your intuition there. Uh, so I will do the simple case of we know the lowest is 1 first, and then I'll just say a little bit about how you generalize. So something more advanced concepts. So M is going to be a random variable. So it's going to denote the largest observed take number. You could, of course, try to come up with a more complicated formula where you also use the second largest take number observed. But I'm not going to do that. I'm going to just do something simple using just the largest. When in doubt, if you can have a simple formula that's much better to use, it's much easier to work with. And a lot of times, the more complicated formulas don't really give you that much gain for all the extra work. The simple formulas often do really well. So I want to calculate what is the probability if I have n takes and I observe k of them that the largest serial number observed is little m. 
So what, what's the probability that big M that I observe it equaling little m? Well, if m is less than k, what's the probability? So I observe k tanks, say I observe 12 tanks, and the largest observed serial number is 3. Is that possible? I observe 12 tanks. You shouldn't be able to observe a larger serial number of 3. If you observe k tanks, what is the smallest, largest serial number you can? You have to pass that properly. It's k. Right? This is where commas and pauses really matter. Uh, everybody knows about, is it uh, koala bears? Yes? Uh, eats, shoots, and leaves. <laughs> koala bears, you know, koala bear eats, shoots, and leaves. Eats, shoots, and leaves, it's what they eat. Or it eats, shoot, oh, I've got to be very careful. Um, you might want to move because this is the second time I've almost killed you. Um, eats, shoots, and then leaves the scene of the crime. Uh, years ago, I was at a, uh, since this is being recorded, I will not say which organization I was at, but I was at a national meeting of scholars, and there was a discussion to do something about gun violence in schools, and there was going to be a motion, and there were a lot of amendments. Should campus security be able to have guns, or do we want to go so far that even campus security can't have guns? And after lots of discussion, they finally put the new version up for us to read, and after about 10 or 12 seconds, half of us have our hands skyrocket <laughs> because there's a comma in the wrong place. And if you read what was put up, we were pretty sure they didn't mean everybody should be given a gun. But the way it was passed, that would happen. So you want to be very careful how you pass this. If I'm looking for the smallest, largest M, it has to be at least K. And the largest, largest M is at most what? N. You can't observe a serial number larger than N. So I really only have to do things for N between K and N. And I want to know, what is the probability? Well, if I have N tanks and I observe K of them, there's N choose K ways to choose K tanks from it. And here's two different ways of calculating that uh, this is the probability of getting M. So if the largest is M, and we're choosing that as a serial number, we must choose K minus 1 tanks from the M minus 1 smaller values. So that's where the M minus 1 choose K minus 1 is. is if I observe one of my tanks to be M, I have to observe K minus 1 other tanks, and they have to be the numbers from 1 to M minus 1. The other way is, this is observing k tanks where the largest value is at most m, but not necessarily m. This is observing k tanks where the largest value is at most m minus 1, but not necessarily m minus 1. So the difference would be all the ones that have exactly m as their largest. So there's two different ways of looking at this. I think the second one here is a little bit more natural. The largest I observe is m, so I have to observe k minus 1 values in the first m minus 1 value. Now I know the probability of observing little m. And what I want to do is I now want to pass from that to an estimate for m. And so this is where we start talking about expected value. So what is the average score? So if you have a bunch of students in the class, if everybody is equal, then if you want to calculate the average score, you would add up all the scores and then divide by the number of students. So I take to find my expected value, my average value, I take each m and I weigh it by the probability it happens. Not all m are equally probable. You know, if m is equal to k, there's only one way that could happen. I would have had to choose. So the larger m is, the more likely it is that that could have happened up to a point. And so the expected value of m is just m times the probability, so I can substitute for the probability. So the question is, can this sum be evaluated in closed form? If yes, then we can have a formula. If not, then we're in trouble. And so now, this is just doing some algebra. I now substitute it for one of these binomial coefficients. And again, when you see algebra on the board, you should never be trying to follow it in real time. It's just, what are the tools and techniques being done? Is this something that if I really gave it to you, could I go through and follow it line by line? If yes, good. If not, let me ask a question. So I substitute for what they are, and then I start doing some cancellations. I pull out things outside the sum that don't depend on m. You know, this stuff over here doesn't depend on m, so I can pull it outside the sum. Mm -hmm. And I'm left with this sum over here. Oh, that sum looks really familiar. 
you know, foreshadowing the art of a great lecture, right? <laughs> there was probably a reason why you know, we proved that identity earlier. And so now we can substitute it. Right? Well, now I explain what is n plus one choose k plus one? I write it out here. Oh, look, I have an n factorial, or I have an n plus one factorial. That's going to give me an n plus one factorial over here. I can simply cancel a bunch of things like this. Here's my formula. And so I have a formula for the expected value of the largest observed number as a function of k and n. Well, if I want to find n, I can then solve for that in terms of the expected value. I can go backwards. And so if I just do the algebra from this, I get n is the expected value of m times 1 plus 1 over k minus 1. So I now put in my best guess for the expected value. My best guess is what I observe. I plug that in here, and there's my formula. So incredibly simple formula. Right. You could do the more advanced one. And so just because this is being recorded, I'm not going to really go through details. The formula changes a little bit. So I've got the spread, and I've got a 2 over k minus 1. Well, if you think about it, should I be able to talk about a spread if I only have one observation? No. Oh. I've got to observe at least two takes. You know, because I don't know what the minimum value is, if I only have one observation, that's completely useless. I need at least two values. If anybody has taught statistics, you can't estimate the standard deviation of the variance with only one observation. You can estimate the mean, sure, but you can't estimate how things vary unless there is something to vary. So the fact that it has a k minus 1 is very reasonable. And if you take you know, the extreme case, if you take uh, basically uh, k equals n, this will come out to give you exactly the right answer again. And then the algebra is just a little bit more involved. I'm not going to go through the details, but the proof is pretty similar. So you know, from Wikipedia again, wonderful table showing the difference between the math stats people and the spies. So this was the intelligence estimate. This is the German records, which you can get after the war. And this is what the math stats people did. So you, know, you want a powerful example to tell your students about why we care about math and stats, why we care about this theoretical stuff? Look at this and give them you know, the Battle of Antietam to look at and the cautiousness of McClellan. Well, he's got the battle plans for the Confederates. But he was so afraid he was outnumbered. You know, he could not take advantage of the opportunities. This is incredible, looking at how accurate these numbers are. And again, you could probably derive more complicated formulas if you want to include, say, maybe the second largest take observed. And the question is, is it worth it? Nowadays, with computers, you could have very complicated formulas. Uh, any football fans here? I have issues with the danger of the sport, but... Um, <laughs> I, so, so I actually went on strike this year but because I will not let my son play, and if I won't let my son play, I feel guilty about watching it. But my son has convinced me I won't play football. Can I please watch with you? So how many of you have heard of the quarterback rating formula? So the formula is extremely complicated. It involves lots of different things, but it's normalized, so it gives out numbers. 100 is a good game. You know, 50 is a bad game. 30 or 40 is like the New York Jets. <laughs> there was, I, I, I can't help saying this, but there was one game where it was either the Jets or the Bills quarterback was so bad, if you pretended that they were the quarterback for the other team, their quarterback rating improved. They threw that many interceptions over so many passes that it would have actually been better to just score them as playing for the other side. But you don't need to know the nuts and the bolts of the quarterback formula. Just knowing roughly that, you know, 80 is not bad, 100 is great, 120 is phenomenal. Something like that is enough to get a sense of what's going on. We can have more complicated formulas now. A lot of times the extra complications don't really give you that much and it's not worth doing. We'd like to have simple formulas. All right. How many people have ever done regression, linear regression, some statistics like this? So I want to talk a little bit about how you can try to use statistics to sniff out relationships. And I'll start with you know, a very famous problem, which does have some applications with cryptography. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about planets. It's changed since I was a kid. We had nine planets. I'm sure everybody, everybody here had nine planets when you were young. I just found out at my daughter's conference that there are now five oceans. 
There's the Southern Ocean as well. Huh? But the National GOV does not recognize the Southern Ocean as an ocean, but other sources recognize now there's five oceans. I, <coughs> so the idea is to find the best fit parameters. So we have some relationship. Let's assume we believe that there's a linear relationship. So I observe a value of x, and I believe y linearly depends on it. Say you know, axi plus b. Think back to the Caesar cipher. We've seen this already. I have three different ways I can measure error. The first is I take what I observe and I subtract what I predicted. The second is I take the absolute value of what I observe and predict. And the third is I square the difference. Going back to Monty Python, one of these is right out. Which one should we never use? The first. Why should we never use the first? I'm sorry? Yeah, if we add the overestimates and the underestimates, they could cancel. So I don't want to save. So imagine I have two data points. Here's one data point, and here's another. And I want to find the best fit line between them. Oops. Does that look like a pretty good best fit line? Yeah. Okay. I claim that the best fit line is actually this. And if, oh. <laughs> interesting. Okay, and the reason is, if I look at the error over here, if I've done it correctly, that's gonna perfectly cancel with the error over there. And you should not have this red line as the best fit line, but it will return an error of zero. If you wanted, you could even have a negative error. I'm not quite sure what that would mean. So that's why the first is right out. So now we're down to the second and the third. They are both legitimate contenders. But there is one of them which, if I am hired as the consultant, I, I will use. And if I'm hiring someone as the consultant, I will have them use the other one. <laughs> And you know which one is easier to work with? Not the absolute value. The square is easier to work with. And the reason is calculus is available. The square function is differentiable. The absolute value function is not. And so by using calculus and a little bit of linear algebra, we can actually come up with closed form expressions for the best values of A and B if we use squares to measure errors. The problem with squares is a small deviation is now magnified. And having one error of two is much worse than having two errors of one. And so one bad observation can really screw your data. That's why if I'm doing the hiring, I prefer the absolute value. But if I'm hired, so what you do is, if you know some calculus, you look at your error function and you set its derivatives equal to zero with respect to A and B, and when you do some algebra at the end of the day, you get explicit forms for A and B. The actual values don't matter. What matters is that there's an explicit solution. So when you talk about what is the best fit value, there is a unique answer. So I serve on a regional school committee. We recently regionalized fully Williamstown and Lanesboro. We had been partly regionalized for decades at the middle high school level but the two town elementary schools were different. So we had three school districts, elementary Williamstown, elementary Lanesboro, middle high school for the two towns. How many school committees do you think we needed for three schools? We had four. We're good. We had two elementary school committees, we had a middle high school committee, and then we had like a super committee of the two elementary schools that was pulled from memberships of the two of them. And then we actually had other things where that super committee and the middle high school committee would work together. So it was an incredible interlocking uh, nightmare. Now you have one? No, we have one. Wow, so do you have one elementary? Or do we have two elementaries, but one, one in each town. But we wanted to unionize, I mean, not to, to regionalize. And one of the things is we had budget on the order of you know, 20, 24 million dollars. You get about 3.5 million a year in chapter 70 funds. If you are not regionalized, the state will tell you how much money goes to each school. Mm -hmm. If you regionalize, they will only tell you how much money goes to the district. Mm -hmm. 
and they won't tell you the formula. So one of my jobs was I can sniff out using linear regression how much money would have gone to each school if we hadn't regionalized. And then this way we can keep the budgets of the two elementary schools separate for the towns. And so this is a great application of statistics and linear regression. And so I got to explain this to the different finance committees and voters, which was a lot of fun. And so when we have a recording malfunction later, I can talk more about that. But uh, I was within $10,000 for the three buildings because things vary very small amounts. I will save the rest for the malfunction. Now, if you could only do linear relationships, it would have limited applicability because most things in life aren't linear. If you teach logarithms to your students, this is one of the best applications of logarithms. It's all about data presentation. So again, I know this is a cryptography class. This is loosely linked to cryptography through. The Germans should have encrypted the serial numbers. And a lot of people do this now so that companies can hide how much they have. So there is at least a connection. But a lot of it is the applicability of looking at things the right way. And you know, we talked about this with the Rubik's Cubes, that if you look at the Rubik's Cubes the right way, these strange cubes are really the same as the standard three by three. Most of the time, sadly, students don't understand why we care so much about logarithms. A lot of relationships are linear after you do a log or a log log transformation. So imagine y equals bx to the a. If I take logs of both sides, I get the log of y is the log of bx to the a, so it's the log of b plus the log of x to the a, it's the log of b plus a log x. And so the reason I'm using a capital B here is I'll let little b be the log of b. So if I have a power relationship like this, it becomes a linear relationship between the log of a, and between the log of x and the log of y. And this is the power of logarithms. Relationships that don't start off looking linear can be made linear, and now I can use linear regression. So here's one of my favorite examples. Kepler had three laws of planetary motion. And these were phenomenally valuable for Newton in terms of trying to sniff out what is the gravitational law. So Kepler's first law, planets travel in elliptical orbits. Not so bad. Next, planets sweep out equal areas in equal time. So if you look at you know, the orbit around the sun, if you look at the sun and you draw a line from the sun to the planet, and you wait one month, and you see what area swept out, that's the same as another month down here. So what it means is when the planet is closer to the sun, it's going to be moving faster to cover more area. So there's an immediate application you can get from that. And then the last law is the Sesame Street. One of these things is not like the other. One of these things just doesn't belong. If T is the orbital period of a planet traveling in an elliptical orbit about the sun and no other objects exist, then T squared, the square of the period, is proportional to the cube of the length of the semi-major axis. This is a little bit different than the other laws. <laughs> so how long it takes the planet to travel around the sun, the square of that is proportional to the cube of the length. Now, one of the things you can do is I can take the square root of both sides. You might notice I have a B tilde here. The reason I have a B tilde is because when I take a square root, I'll just call that B. And now I have T is B times the length to the 1.5. Well, if I do a log-log transformation, you'll get the log of the period should have a linear relationship. And now I can try to do a plot and see what should 1.5 be. So here's some data. So here's the length of the semi-major axis of the planets. Mercury coming in at 0.387, all the way up to Neptune is 30.06. It pains me to stop at Neptune, but I will respect current convention. Here is the orbital periods. Any thoughts about what B should be? It's a constant. B's a constant. But I'm claiming you should be able to figure out what B is from looking at this data because of the units we're using. Earth is one. <laughs> for both of them. So what should B equal? If when, when Earth, we have a one and a one, so it doesn't even matter what A is. What should big B be? But we're choosing units of length where the length of Earth's thing is one, and the length of the Earth here is basically one. So there's a lot of great units of mathematics. There's the Bruno, which is the indentation in cubic centimeters from dropping a grand piano off like the second or third story floor of a building at MIT. There's the Smoot. I don't know if any of you went over that bridge today. Oh, that's the, the length of certain. Yes. 
So Smoot was a pledge at a fraternity at MIT, and they wanted to know how many Smoots long was the bridge. So they just kept picking him up and locking him down. Yeah. The town of Cambridge, the city of Cambridge was not pleased. They painted over it. Well, the fraternity wasn't going to be stopped. So they just took Smoot again, and this went back and forth. And now it's so accepted that they've institutionalized the Smoot marks. And when there's an accident on the bridge, they report how many Smoots from the end was the accident. And they repaint them now. And they repaint them now. They repaint them now. And Smoot eventually became the president of like a national board of standards. Wow. I'm sure, well, yeah, I, I am a unit of measure. <laughs> uh, one of my other favorite units is anybody with the Lily Cullen is? Yeah. It's disputed as to who invented the Lily Cullen. It is enough beauty to launch one ship. Oh, oh, enough beauty to launch one ship. Uh -huh. Yeah, Helen is too much for most people that you meet in life. Your present company, of course, excluded. <laughs> but uh, lots of fun you have. So here is a plot of a long, long plot of planet periods as a function of planet lengths. Incredible fit. Wow. And we get 1.49986.0001487.96. Not bad. And again, there are other planets in the system, so you know you're not expecting a perfect relationship. And in fact, so uh, what, what that's what that is saying is a good fit is that that Kepler's third law is a really good formula. Yes, and in okay. fact, if you thought that there was some relationship between the period and the length, and you made this plot, you would conjecture that the period is proportional to the length to the 1.5. So this is a way to see Kepler's law from data. So if you didn't know what Kepler's law was, here's a way to try to infer it. And of course, the problem is in the real world, the planets do pull on each other. That's going to cause some smaller perturbations. Because the law said <coughs> no, no other planets. No other planets. So if you have the ideal situation of just one star and one planet, this is what you would get. And in fact, um, up until, say, the 1700s, the furthest planet known was Saturn. Then in the 1700s, Herschel discovered Uranus, and in probably the greatest example of ass kissing in the history of science, decided to name it after his sovereign, you know, King George. King George was thrilled, the rest of Europe was not, and after some negotiation, they said, well, Saturn is the father of Jupiter, so let's go with Uranus, the father of Saturn, and we'll do that as the name. We're not gonna let him name it after you. For a long time after that, things worked pretty well, and then eventually they discovered that the orbit of Uranus was a little bit off. And so some people hypothesized that maybe there's another planet far away, and every now and then their orbits are close to each other, and it will yank Uranus. And so two different groups were predicting where this planet should be. And one person, the Frenchman Lavalier, was able to convince the astronomers to point the telescopes before Adams and Britain could. They pointed their telescopes and they found the planet. And this was like the rock star celebrity of the you know, mid 1800s. He predicted mathematically where a planet should be. He then turned his attention to Mercury, whose orbit was a little bit off. And if, if you've just predicted a planet successfully to fix the issues with Uranus, let's try the same thing with Mercury. Maybe there's a planet between the sun and Mercury. And they named that planet Vulcan after the god of the forge. And so they said, well, it's going to be kind of hard to see because you're looking directly at the sun. But on certain eclipses, you might be able to just barely see it. And so they predicted when the first chance to see it was, they had people train their telescopes, and what do you think happened? No. Most people didn't see it. Some people saw it. And this is the danger when you have preconceptions. It's very easy with you having data or difficult data to have your preconceptions. I want to be the one to verify the theory. So they thought they saw it. And then as time passes, and as the telescopes get better and better and better, they can say, if a planet exists, it can't be larger than this. And eventually it gets to the point where you have maybe a couple of small little particles and nowhere near enough to fix Mercury. And it wasn't until Einstein and general relativity that we finally got the whole story, where there's this equivalence between matter and energy. And if you look at the energy field from the sun, that's a little extra mass, and that fixes mercury and has smaller effects on the rest of the planets. 
But you know, I love this chart as just showing the power of statistics. How many of you have heard of the birthday problem? Oh, yeah. So I'm not brave enough to do it in this one. But if you assume birthdays are uniformly distributed, which is not the case in every cell, how many people do you need in a room before you have at least a 50% chance that two people share a birthday? And in, on this planet, it's around 21, 22. Yeah. Correct. You're not specifying how many people share your birthday. It's how many people do you need before some peer shares a birthday. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of great stuff you can do. It turns out you can show it's about the if you had D days in a year, it's about D to the one half the square root of log. I'm going to ask a slightly different one. What if you want to just try to um, see how many people you need before you have the first collision. What's the expected number, not how many people do you need before you have a 50% chance. It's not quite the same problem, it's close. You might expect it's still gonna be around square root of D. And you know, here are some plots. Um, I ran it twice. Here's the best fit line. So again, I'm assuming a relationship, you know, how many people as a function of uh, number of days in the year to some exponent. I think A should be about a half. And when I do this, I'm getting A is 0.506 for the first one and 0.481 for the second one. So A is a half is pretty good. But I'm getting wildly different values for little b. And if you think about it, A is the more important quantity, especially when you take logarithms. B is going to have a very small shift of the whole line up and down. And so it's always a good idea to have an idea of how good is your method, how sensitive is it, how much can you trust the result. I trust the value for A a lot more than I trust the value for B. A is going to capture more of the feature of what's happening. We can do this for the German tank problem. And so this is a little bit more advanced. Um, I was looking at the excess number of tanks and minus what I observed. And it turns out it does a terrible job. Mm -hmm. And the reason it does a terrible job is I have little m on both sides of the equation. I'm supposed to do my quantity, which depends on everything on the right. And I put M on both sides, I try to cheat. And the data basically realizes that I'm trying to cheat and is giving me a terrible answer. Mm -hmm. you know, I should be getting A is about one, and I'm getting a terrible value of point seven, similarly off for B. So I'm now doing it more accurately, I'm plotting the log of N against the log of M in one over K. So this is a little bit more involved, but um, just very quickly, So you know, if we go back, we had something like m times one plus one over k minus one. Eh, let's let m be large and k be large, so I don't really have to worry about the minus one. So if I believe that this is what n is, I can take logs of both sides, and I would get the log of n should be the log of m plus the log of one plus one over k. And now, if you know a little calculus or know a little bit about the logarithm, the log of 1 plus 1 over k is approximately 1 over k. It's not a bad approximation. And so if I do this, I now have a nice relationship. And so my two variables are log of m and 1 over k. And I have this conjectured linear relationship. And I can try to figure out, you know, let's look at maybe a log m plus b 1 over k. Oops. And that's what we're seeing over here, is when you actually do this, it comes out to being a really good uh, fit in terms of equations to whatever we're doing. So you know, it ends with you know, a couple of you know, references if you want to read more about the problem. And then the appendix is where you can always just pause and just the slides also online. It's just, the algebra is a little bit more involved if you want to do unknown variance. I mean, unknown uh, styling number. But you can still handle it using very similar techniques. Yes, I would love, yes. Or well, we can just see who's paying attention at you. But so what I like about this is basic math, you know, combinatorics, basic statistics, you're know, finding the best fit line, logarithm, how do you present data? And you again, when I present it like this, 
it's very hard for me. If the colors were changed, these two blue things here were red, and this over here, you know, if these were all one color, that would be very different. It would be it would easily draw my eye to how to look at it. So when you know, I'm talking with my students, it's so easy to mislead. How should you look at things impartially? How can you sniff out a formula? And with a little bit of work, we actually got a pretty good approximation. And we said, well, let's look at extreme cases. And we actually got, here's what the formula should be. Absolutely. And so when you're going to your students, they can sniff out a lot of formulas, or at least how it should depend. There's you know, the unit analysis of what should the pendulum period be as a function of the mass, the length, and gravity. And you can sniff this out by doing a unit analysis. So these are really good techniques to emphasize. The last one is the need for encryption. That you are giving out information you may not be aware of. And the Germans did not realize that there was information that was being transmitted against their knowledge. So I will end with the target story and then we'll break for lunch. Does anybody know about the target story from the Midwest, I think Minnesota, where a father is extremely upset and yells at the manager because they just got some coupons which have all this pregnancy stuff. You know, why are you saying this? My wife and I are well past the age of having children, and you know, my kids are too young to be having children. I'm very, 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 very sorry. So the manager from Target you know, gives them some gift cards or something, and a few days later calls him up to make sure everything is okay. And so the father is extremely sheepish. It turns out his daughter was engaged in some extracurricular activities he was not aware of, and those coupons will be useful. And so the question is, how did Target know before he did that his daughter was pregnant? Correlated purchases. People who buy you, so if you go anywhere nowadays, it's, if you bought this, you're probably interested in this as well. We have recommendations. And so based on what was being bought, it was highly likely that she's pregnant or somebody's pregnant and that you would like this. So the genius part, the marketing part now is Target still wants to target you. If this bothers you, don't shop in a store named Target. <laughs> But they don't want you to know that you're being targeted because that bothers some people. So they still want you to get the coupons for the baby products. So what, what do you do? Yeah, mix them up. So you look at some things that are anti-correlated with pregnancy and you put those in so it looks like it's a bunch of random coupons. And you might put the pregnancy coupons in key strategic places that are more likely to be seen. So there's a lot of wonderful stuff that can be done with all this. Okay.